The Word of God, the Holy Bible, is a treasure and a gift beyond compare. Every passage of it points to a marvelous truth that God's love for man impelled him to step out of eternity and unite with his creation in order to redeem him from sin. Jesus Christ is both the author and subject of this precious word. Join us at the Superior Word each week as we search out this wonderful gift in search of Christ Jesus. Psalm 53, to the chief musician, Satu Mahalat, a contemplation of David. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt and have done abominable iniquity. There is none who does good. God looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek God. Every one of them is turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is none who does good. No, not one. Have the workers of iniquity no knowledge who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon God? There they are in great fear where no fear was for God has scattered the bones of him who camps against you. You have put them to shame because God has despised them. Oh, that salvation of Israel would come out of Zion when God brings back the captivity of his people. Let Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. And we've got for our sermon text today, 16 verses. Like I say, a lot of information, but the main thing is understanding the pattern that comes out of them. What's that? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Exodus chapter 40, verses 1 through 16. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, On the first day of the first month, you shall set up the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. You shall put in it the ark of the testimony and partition off the ark with the veil. You shall bring in the table and arrange the things that are to be set in order on it, and you shall bring in the lampstand and light its lamps. You shall also set the altar of gold for the incense before the ark of the testimony and put up the screen for the door of the tabernacle. Then you shall set the altar of the burnt offering before the door of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting, and you shall set the labor between the tabernacle of meeting and the altar and put water in it. You shall set up the court all around and hang the screen at the court gate, and you shall take the anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle and all that is in it, and you shall hallow it and all its utensils, and it shall be holy. You shall anoint the altar of the burnt offering and all its utensils and consecrate the altar. The altar shall be most holy. And you shall anoint the laver in its base and consecrate it. Then you shall bring Aaron and his sons to the door of the tabernacle of meeting and wash them with water. You shall put the holy garments on Aaron and anoint him and consecrate him that he may minister to me as priest. And you shall bring his sons and clothe them with tunics. You shall anoint them as you anointed their father that they may minister to me as priests. For their anointing shall surely be an everlasting priesthood throughout their generations. Thus Moses did according to all that the Lord had commanded him. So he did. As always, Sunday night, I was concerned about the sermon typing coming up the next day. There is, once again, a great deal of repetition in these verses as the obedience of Moses to the command of the Lord is being evaluated. I asked the Lord for his hand to be upon me, as my custom is, and then in the morning I asked him to prepare my fingers for the battle which lay ahead. As I got going, I began to realize that there is a pattern which is in this section which seemed to match things going on in another book of the Bible. Being a bit dull, though, it took me several verses and maybe even half the sermon to realize that the pattern didn't just match that other book's pattern, but it matches it exactly. Considering that Exodus was written at the time of Moses, almost 1,500 years before the coming of Christ, and considering that John wrote from memory what he had heard, and finally, considering that this pattern, at least to my knowledge, and I did an internet search to see if anybody else had come out with this, was never seen before 31 October of 2016. It shows, once again, that the Word of God has many secrets waiting to be revealed. How can it be that countless scholars have poured over this book time and time again, and yet the pattern remained unknown? It is because it wasn't yet ready to be revealed. But as we go on, you will see that it is precise, and it is also as obvious as the nose on your face once you see it. What a gift, and what a treasure. And yet we find more time to watch sports or maybe movies than we do reading the Bible, this precious jewel handed to us by God through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Where are our priorities? 
where indeed. Our text verse comes from Deuteronomy chapter 29. It's the 29th verse. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. The Bible is literally filled with secret things. In his own providential timing, the Lord whispers them out to us. He opens our ear and speaks softly into it. Or maybe he wakes us up in the night with the spark of his divine will filling our mind with something that we had never before considered. Or he may even open our eyes to something while we're reading the word. And when he does, we need to grab the moment. We need to seize the opportunity and to search out what he is telling us. It is true that not everything people think they find is actually valid. Far too often, those who claim they found something is so far off base that we blush in embarrassment, looking for a way to tell them that they've missed the target. But there are a lot of targets that aren't missed as well. One of them is seen in today's passage concerning the erection of the sanctuary and its consecration. This is then followed up with the consecration of Aaron and his sons. But it matches something going on in the book of John in a marvelous way. And it is all there to reveal to us Jesus. Yes, it's all to be found in his superior word. And so let's turn to that precious word once again. And may God speak to us through his word today. And may his glorious name ever be praised. I have just two thoughts for you today. The first is setting up the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. It's verses 1 through 8. Verse 1, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Vedaber Yehovah el Moshe lemor. These exact words have not been spoken to Moses since Exodus 31, verse 1. That was 17 sermons ago, a time which included the incident with the golden calf and everything that has transpired since then. Now the words are spoken again to introduce an entirely new thought, one which has actually been anticipated since Exodus 25 and the calling of the people by the Lord to donate for the construction of the tabernacle. That was a full 37 sermons ago. Once again now, the words of introductory preparation are written for us to stop and to consider what lies ahead. Something new and marvelous is on the way. What will it be? Verse 2, on the first day of the first month, what is to be done will be done at the turn of the year. It is a new time and a new season. The chosen first month for the redemptive calendar year was given in Exodus 12, verse 2. It was the month of their deliverance from Egypt, and the Lord told them that it would be the first of their months from that point on. Here's what it says in Exodus 12, verse 2. This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. The name of the month is Aviv. It was specifically given in Exodus 13, verse 4. It is to be on the first of this month and exactly 345 days after departing from Egypt and 300 days since arriving at Sinai that this new instruction was to be carried out. Thus it will occur on the first day of their first full year of freedom and it will be the first day of the designated redemptive year in the year 2515 from the creation of the world. And that instruction is, verse 2 continuing, you shall set up the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. The words are correct. Both terms, mishkan, or tabernacle, and ohel moed are used, which is the tent of meeting. The words are placed in apposition, meaning that they are grammatically almost parallel. But the tabernacle resided within the tent, it being set up first, and then the tent being raised over it. Further, it is the tent of meeting, not the tent of congregation, which is used by the King James Version. The tent of meeting is where the Lord would meet with his designated representative, not the congregation. Though the many parts of the sanctuary had been made by the people, and though they had been approved by Moses as meeting the specifications given by the Lord, it was not just completed and caused to be raised. Rather, the Lord has determined the appointed times and seasons for all redemptive workings, this included the erection of the marvelous edifice, which has been so painstakingly fashioned in order to picture the person and the work of Christ to come. By having it raised on the first day of the first month, the entire ordination process for it would be complete in time for the celebration of the first Passover, which would be held on the 14th of the same month. As this is the approximate time of the spring equinox, the rising sun would be directly to the east, 
and thus it would be to the backs of those who were worshiping towards the most holy place where the ark was to be located. Further, as the first day of the month is the day of the new moon, there would be no moon visible in the sky at that time. In both cases, it is a direct challenge to any notion of sun or moon worship. The creator, not the creation, was to be worshipped by the people of Israel. The precedence was being set in this selected timing. Another reason for selecting the new year was to set up the hearts of the people for a new beginning. The year past had shown them failing many times in their devotion to the Lord, culminating in the tragic instance of the golden calf. Now, with the new year, there would be a new beginning and a chance to serve the Lord all the better in the year to come, hopefully. And it's awful funny that here we're here in the first day of the new year as well. I typed this thing 10, 12 weeks ago, having no idea that today the sermon would be done. But we're all being prepared for the new year right now, and hopefully we'll follow this admonition as well. Verse 3, he shall put in it the ark of the testimony. The very purpose of building the sanctuary was for a place where the ark could reside. It is, in essence, the soul of the entire sanctuary. It is the spot where the presence of the Lord would reside and where the high priest once a year would come to petition the Lord for mercy for the sins committed by the people. And the ark itself was only a receptacle for something greater, for the tablets of the testimony. Without the tablets, the ark was just a wooden box that was splendidly ornamented with gold. And so it is with us. We can be the most splendid example of humanity that anybody has seen. We could be a hulking weightlifter like I am, or the most beautiful movie star possible like my wife. But without adherence to the word of God, we're just another person which happens to be more ornamented than the rest of us around us. In Christ alone is there an embodiment of the word of God. And thus he is the very soul of the Lord's temple. For those who are in Christ, we are there with him in the most holy place, having satisfied the law, not through our own efforts, but through the work of Jesus Christ. The importance of what this ark pictures cannot be understated. It needs to be repeated like a children's story again and again until it is ingrained in our very being. This placing of the ark in the tabernacle is parallel to John's words which begin his gospel. The very first sentence of the gospel of John, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The tablets are representative of Christ the word. Verse 3 continues, and partition off the ark with the veil. The Hebrew says, Vesakota al ha'aron et ha'paroket, and cover against the ark the veil. The ark is not covered with the veil, but it is a covering nonetheless. The word sakak was used when the Lord said that he would place Moses in the cleft of the rock and cover him with his hand. The veil would stand between the holy place where the priests ministered daily and the most holy place where the Lord resided. It was to signify the unapproachable nature of the Lord. There was a division or a fracture between him and man, even between him and the priests ordained to minister before him. The priests were kept from profaning his presence, and they were protected from being destroyed by him by the placement of this veil. And as a reminder, on this veil were woven cherubim, as if guardians of the presence. It is a picture of the cherubim which guard the way back to Eden. This veil will remain for almost 1,500 years until the time of Christ's crucifixion where it's going to be torn asunder, allowing all who will come to simply come. Any may enter the most holy place in that land of delight once again by a mere act of faith. In Christ, the fracture is healed and the divide is removed. The guardian angels rest their flaming swords and peace with God is restored. The veil, as we have seen already in other sermons, represents Christ's physical body. This corresponds to John 1, verse 14. And the word became flesh, a physical human body, and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Verse 4, you shall bring in the table and arrange the things that are to be set in order on it. The table of showbread was minutely described in Exodus 25. It is the first piece of furniture to be brought into the holy place. As you certainly remember, it pictures Christ, our bread of life. This is, as he himself proclaimed in John 6, verse 35, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me 
shall never thirst. Thus, this table pictures the Lord coming in a limited way into the holy place to commune with his people. As John Lang describes this, by this symbolic communion with the priests, he discloses to the people the hope of fellowship with him and the fellowship of his spirit, of his blessings. The things that are to be set in order on this table have not yet been described, only the implements, but not what they held. This shows us that some of the book of Leviticus was probably already being compiled prior to the raising of the tabernacle. Here's what was to be set in order, which is described in Leviticus 24, which is almost at the end of the book of Leviticus. And you shall take fine flour and bake 12 cakes with it. Two tenths of an ephah shall be in each cake. You shall set them in two rows, six in a row, on the pure gold table before the Lord. And you shall put pure frankincense on each row, that it may be on the bread for a memorial, an offering made by fire to the Lord. Every Sabbath he shall set it in order before the Lord continually, being taken from the children of Israel by an everlasting covenant. And it shall be for Aaron and his sons, and they shall eat it in a holy place, for it is most holy to him from the offerings of the Lord made by fire by a perpetual statute. Verse 4 continues, And you shall bring in the lampstand and light its lamps. Only after the table was brought in was the menorah to be brought in. If the table signified a feast, then the lights are lighted in order for that feast to be held. It is of note that Jesus first proclaimed himself the bread of life in John chapter 6, and then proclaimed this in John 8 verse 12. I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Thus his proclamations match in the order of the furniture which had been brought into this holy place. The instructions here are to light its lamps. But this was done specifically at a prescribed time each day, a time known as between the evenings, and thus about 3 p.m. Verse 5, you shall also set the altar of a gold for the incense before the Ark of the Testimony. The term before the Ark of the Testimony means outside the veil in the holy place and directly in front of where the Ark sat behind the veil. The table was to the south. The menorah was to the north, but with its lamps illuminating the south side. As the presence of the Lord symbolically comes to fellowship with the priests through the veil and the placement of the table of showbread, so likewise the prayers symbolically go through the veil and into the most holy place by the wafting of the incense which is offered on the altar. Despite there being a fracture or a divide between the two, communion was possible through these two points. As the bread can be equated with the word of God which nourishes, and as the incense can be equated with the prayers of the people, the Lord fellowshiped with his people through the word, and they with him through prayer. How much more now can we truly fellowship with the Lord when we have the full word of God available to us, and we have the Holy Spirit who receives our prayers and sends them directly through our mediator to God the Father? We have the full and unhindered access to the very throne of grace, and we have the full revelation of God available to us at this time in the completed word, the Holy Bible. Truly, this dispensation which we live in is the most blessed of times yet for those who are eager to fellowship intimately with God. Verse 5 continues, And put up the screen for the door of the tabernacle. The screen, or masak, is that which separates the holy place from the outside courtyard. This screen is what is set at the pathak, or the doorway, for access into the tabernacle. And once again, in order, we have Jesus claim that he is the door in John 10, verse 7. Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. The order of his proclamations follows in a remarkable way with the order of these things now being set up. Verse 6, then you shall set the altar of the burnt offering before the door of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. The altar is next mentioned, and it is said to be before the door of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting, despite it having the laver between it and the actual tent. This placement then answers to that of the altar of incense and the ark. Just as those two are being connected together, so are the brazen altar and the door. Why would this be unless there was more symbolism which is calling out to be seen? What is it about the altar and the door which are so intricately connected. Again, we just need to go to the book of John and see which I am statement of Jesus is next. In John 10, verse 7, and in John 10, verse 9, he says that he is the door. 
immediately after this, in John 10, verse 11, he says this, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep, implying a sacrifice. The altar is where the sacrificial lamb was slaughtered for the sins of the people. And so Christ, who gave his life, is detailed directly after the door in the setting up of the sanctuary and directly after the door in the book of John. Only by dying for the sins of the people can Christ be the door by which we have access again to the Father. There is a continued precision in the word which spans thousands of years and the writing of these men who were inspired by the Spirit of God to write and record these things. Verse 7, And you shall set the labor between the tabernacle of meeting and the altar and put water in it. Oddly, the New King James Version changes the terms here from what should be tent of meeting to the tabernacle of meeting. I don't know why they do that. The King James Version sticks with tent, but says of the congregation. Both are incorrect. It is ohel moed, or tent of meeting. It is before this tent of meeting that the labor is next to be set up. However, the labor is closer to the tent than to the altar, and it begs the question, why then wasn't this detailed first? We have partially answered this already. The altar answers to the door. One cannot enter the door until the sins are paid for by the death of the sacrifice. However, one who is dead cannot enter anything. If we simply died on the altar with Christ and nothing more happened, we would have a very hard time moving. But something wonderful happens to those who die in Christ. They are raised to new life through the power of the Holy Spirit. The laver, in a sense, is a foreshadowing of our baptism in Christ. When we are baptized, we are making a picture of what Christ has done for us. This is why the one baptizing should make two proclamations during the baptism. Buried with Christ in his death, this is when a person is dunked under, and raised to newness of life by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is when the person is brought back up out of the water. And this is what makes our continued journey possible. We don't merely die with Christ, we are raised with Christ and seated with him in the heavenly places. We gain access through the door and continue heading west to the land of delight. And this is what the next I am statement of Jesus proclaims. In John 11 verse 25, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. One cannot wash and be sanctified if they are not resurrected. The labor is the seal of the resurrection and that it has come about, and new life is then granted. We are justified in Christ's death. We are sanctified through the resurrection and the sealing of the Spirit. Paul tells us this in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 13. He says, But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. It is of note that the Hebrew of this verse specifically says these words, Venatata sham mayim, or, and you shall put water into it. They could have first filled the laver, but the Lord specifically calls for it to be placed and then filled. The reason is that one must first receive Christ dying to sin and then be granted the Spirit. The order of the placement of each item is detailed, and it is beautiful. Verse 8, you shall set up the court all around. The tabernacle and tent weren't just exposed to the pagan world around them. They were instead enclosed by a court, which kept the holy places separate from the world, and which also kept out any who would come near with empty hands. But unlike Eden, which was also closed off from the world, and with no seeming possibility to re-enter, we see that there is, in fact, a means of access. Verse 8 continues, and hang up the screen at the court gate. There was a masak or a covering here as well. This is the same word that was just used in verse 5 for the screen at the doorway. But this time it leaves off the term pathach or door. Instead it uses the term sha'ar or gate. A different word is used to describe essentially the same thing. Why would this be? The answer is that once again the terminology is given to show us the next I am statement and proclamation of Jesus Christ. In John 14, 6 comes that next statement. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There is one means of access into the sanctuary for the outside world. One, and only one. Likewise, Jesus claims to be that exclusive access which this screen only pictures. 
He is the way back to restoration with God, which was lost at the very dawn of man's time on earth. The world hates the concept of a single path to God, but Moses gave us a foreshadowing of it in Genesis chapter 3. He continues to give us a taste of it in the details of the tabernacle, and Jesus boldly proclaimed that he alone is able to make these pictures and symbols come to life through his life, his work, and his being. We ignore these marvelous clues at our own great peril. I am the Lord who is here for you. I am with you always, so have no fear. Be strengthened through my word, this you shall do, and through this word to you I will come near. Trust in me and know that I am with you always. In your walk, don't be terrified or afraid. Instead, cling to this word throughout all of your days and never let your heart from me be swayed. Seek me diligently and by you I shall be found. Look to me and let me be your delight. I am here with you as if by sight and by sound. I am with you all the day and throughout each long night. Our second thought today is the rite of consecration, which is verses 9 through 16. Verse 9, and you shall take the anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle and all that is in it, and you shall hallow it and all its utensils, and it shall be holy. That everything associated with the tabernacle was to be anointed with oil is a clear reference to the presence of the Spirit. Without the life of the Spirit, nothing effectual for the redemptive process is possible. But when the Spirit is present, the anointing is both from the Spirit and for the Spirit. If you missed the sermon on the holy anointing oil, it would be good for you to go back and take the time to watch that. In it, you will gain an immensely detailed understanding of the work of Christ, which is seen in every single detail. Just as the entire edifice was anointed, so the Spirit of Christ is behind every single aspect of the building of his church. Nothing occurs apart from him, and all of it is for him, as Paul says in Romans, for of him, and through him, and to him, are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Verse 10, you shall anoint the altar of the burnt offering and all its utensils and consecrate the altar. The altar shall be most holy. Only after mentioning the tabernacle and all that is in it is that which is outside then anointed. However, in this verse it says that the altar shall be most holy, whereas the previous verse said that the tabernacle and all of it was only to be holy. The scholars at Cambridge seem to find a contradiction in this by stating this. It is remarkable, while in Exodus 30, verse 29, the tent of meeting with all the vessels belonging to it are, by anointing, made most holy. Here the altar is only most holy, and the tent of meeting and all its contents are only holy. As is typical with them, they try to introduce doubt into the minds of the readers as to the consistency and thus the reliability of the word. However, the difference in terminology does not signify any higher or lesser degree of holiness. Instead, the terms are used as a caution for the priests and the people. The people could come no nearer to the Lord than the altar of burnt offering. It is termed most holy here as a warning that no layman could touch it, lest they become devoted to the Lord. We saw that in a previous sermon. The holy of the other implements implies most holy because only the priests could come near them. The holiness of the altar had to be precisely stated as most holy so that the people would not err and die. Verse 11, and you shall anoint the laver in its base and consecrate it. Nothing is said of the laver in its base being holy or most holy, and yet it is consecrated through anointing. This may seem odd, but the laver is after the altar where the common people could not pass. This implies that anyone who was at the labor was already acceptable to touch the altar, and thus they were holy. However, the labor is for washing of defilement, something which is not holy. And so the labor itself must be holy in order to wash away the defilement in order for the priests to be acceptable to go on, meaning into the holy place and the most holy place. Everything about the labor speaks of a sanctification process which is needed for the already accepted priest of God to continue in his duties. It is the place where cleansing occurs as he goes about his business. It is the Word of God, the Bible. We've seen this already in other sermons. We come to it with our stains and our impurities, and we leave it cleansed and purified. And yet it never picks up our defilement. It is a constant and endless stream of water available to purify the soul of the believer. 
Understanding this, are you using it as such? When you pick up the stains of life each day, do you come to the Bible and wash yourself clean once again? You cannot move forward without it. And so come to it often and cleanse yourself with the healing water of the word. Verse 12, then you shall bring Aaron and his sons to the door of the tabernacle of meeting and wash them with water. Again, it is the tent, not the tabernacle. Make a note if your Bible says otherwise. The Bible is a book of beauty and precision, and so consistency in translation is always something to be desired. It is at the door of the tent of meeting that Aaron and his sons were to be brought. This is speaking of where the laver stood, and it is from this laver that they would be fully washed, signifying their acceptability once and for all as priests. It is symbolic of the full washing that occurs at the moment a believer comes to Christ. He is cleansed, and he is purified from all unrighteousness. After this, the priests will only wash their hands and their feet, signifying the ongoing purification which was needed to keep them acceptable to perform their duties. The same is true for us, which is what is pictured in these ancient rites and rituals. Verse 13, you shall put the holy garments on Aaron and anoint him and consecrate him that he may minister to me as priest. Aaron, though a fallen man, was a type of Christ as our high priest. He was to be set apart and consecrated in order to serve as a priest. Likewise, as we saw in the details for the consecration of Aaron in Exodus 29, Christ Jesus was set apart for his duties as our true high priest. That is referred to in the Gospels, but it is most detailed and explained for us in the book of Hebrews. For almost 1,500 years, the priestly line of Aaron was invested with these holy garments, which pointed to and pictured the coming Messiah. What is both exciting, very exciting to me, and yet saddening, is that there is a person alive today who has been selected as the next high priest of Israel. He will be washed, he will be anointed, and he will be consecrated for his duties, but there will be no true life in his investiture or in his actions. Instead, Israel missed the boat and is heading down a misguided path of works under the law once again. The good of this is that eventually that path will lead them to their true Messiah, but it will be a path filled with pain and suffering before they get there. Verse 14, and you shall bring his sons and clothe them with tunics. The sons of Aaron are emblematic of the sons of God through the work of Christ. It is we who they picture. Their white tunics symbolize the pure white righteousness that we possess because of him. These sons, though, for the dispensation of the law, were those who ministered before the Lord in their daily duties. Verse 15, you shall anoint them as you anointed their father, that they may minister to me as priests. The timing of the ordination of Aaron and his sons is often speculated to be later than that of the sanctuary. This is because it is detailed in Leviticus chapter 8. However, this needs to be argued against for several reasons. The first is that though the command is given and only later enacted, the same is true with the sanctuary itself. The Lord has given the command to erect it, and it will be erected after the command at the time specified. There's no reason to assume that just because the details of the priest's ordination are written later, that they're actually conducted any later than that of the tabernacle itself. Secondly, in the raising up of the tabernacle in verses 30 through 32 of this chapter, it says this, He shall set the labor between the tabernacle of meeting and the altar and put water there for washing. And Moses, Aaron, and his sons would wash their hands and their feet with water from it whenever they went into the tabernacle of meeting. And when they came near the altar, they washed as the Lord had commanded Moses. Therefore, the details are already out of any chronological order, even as the erection of the details are being given. And thirdly, if the tabernacle and all of its associated furniture was considered holy through the consecration process, but Aaron and his sons were not, then they would not be able to serve as priests, or they themselves would incur guilt and die. Rather, the recording of all of these details is done in specific categories rather than chronologically. The categorical details are kept together for a logical reading of each step of the process. Verse 15 continues, For their anointing shall surely be an everlasting priesthood throughout their generations. The priesthood of Aaron was anointed at this time, and it passed down to each subsequent generation after him. Any new anointing of later high priests is glaringly left unstated. 
especially at the time of the transfer of the garments from Aaron to his son at Aaron's death. However, in Leviticus 21, verse 10, it does appear that each next high priest did have anointing oil poured on his head. From this, the priesthood was passed down as an everlasting ordinance. Unfortunately, these words, everlasting priesthood, lead to one of the frequent questions that I receive concerning the law of Moses and its duration. How can we not be required to observe the law if it was for an everlasting priesthood throughout their generations? The question is faulty because it doesn't read the intent of the passage. The translation into English, though not incorrect, is vague. Further, it does not take in the whole counsel of Scripture. An everlasting priesthood does not mean an eternal priesthood. The word olam simply means to the vanishing point. Whatever point in the eternal counsels of God that Christ would come and annul the first covenant, the priesthood would likewise be annulled. It would meet its vanishing point. This is stated by the author of Hebrews in Hebrews 7. Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed of necessity, there is also a change of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe from which no man is officiated at the altar. The law is an old, Christ is a new high priest. The generations of the priesthood ended. It had met the vanishing point. We serve God under a new covenant. If you are still stuck under the old, you err in your walk and you are not pleasing to God. Finally, in this verse, it cannot go without note that this ordination process of Aaron and his sons corresponds directly to Jesus' final I am proclamation. In John 15, he said the following, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, now listen to this because this is going to be proven in just a minute, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it should be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. Only when one is in Christ can they be productive in Christ. But not all who are in him are productive, nor does his word abide in them. The priests of Israel were ordained to be priests to God, just as we are called to be. They were to be about the Lord's business and to be effective stewards of his. If his word failed to abide in them, there would be consequences. As a confirmation of this, we read the following account of Aaron's two oldest sons. They failed to let the word abide in their lives and the fire consumed them, just as Jesus' words say about what would happen to us. Then Nadav and Avihu, the sons of Aaron each took his censer and put fire in it, put incense on it, and offered profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them. Think of Jesus' I am proclamation there. And they died before the Lord. And Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord spoke, saying, by those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. And before all the people, I must be glorified. So Aaron held his peace. The seven I am's of Jesus are reflected in the process of raising the tabernacle and in its consecration and of that for Aaron and his sons. This cannot be by chance, but was by the guiding of the Holy Spirit each step of the way. Now let us consider why the ark and the veil have no I am statement attached to them. First, the ark which bears the word pictures that which already existed, the word of God. In the beginning was the word, right? This is why it is introduced first as a statement of fact in John 1, verse 1. Next, the veil, which is explicitly said to be the body of Christ in the book of Hebrews, was prepared by God for Christ to dwell in. That is why John 1, 14 follows after the statement of John 1, 1. Only then are the seven I am's stated. However, that brings us a problem, doesn't it? There is one glaring omission concerning the furniture. There is no I am statement for the altar of incense, which is placed in front of the veil between the table of showbread and the menorah. Why would this be? The reason is the same as the order in which it was instructed to be made. The ark, the table, and the lampstand were all detailed way, way back in Exodus chapter 25. 
However, the altar of incense wasn't detailed until Exodus 30, like a jillion sermons later. The placement of the altar had to be noted here as the furniture was set up, but the purpose for it did not take effect until all of Christ's work was finished. Only after the last I am statement by Jesus in John 15 comes Jesus' high priestly prayer of John 17. The prayer of his for us and our continued prayers today took effect when Christ's work was complete. Only when one is in Christ can their prayers be acceptable to God. As we noted earlier, the placement of this altar answers to the placement of the ark and the veil, just as the placement of the altar of burnt offering answers to the door of the tent of meeting, bypassing the laver. The precision in the layout is immense, as is matched by what occurs in the book of John, and it is astonishing. Every single thing finds its exact and proper place only when you go to the book of John. And so it is for us. Each step is logical and orderly as we move from understanding the work of Jesus to applying it to our lives. When we do, we are able to come boldly to the throne of grace where our prayers and our petitions are heard once again. Like the ark and the veil, no I am statement is necessary for this altar. The work was fulfilled and the nature of the person is understood through what he has done. He is our mediator, and through him, our prayers, signified by the incense, is passed through him to God. Now, you're the first people that I know of in all of human history to see this pattern. And this goes back to Moses' time, and it goes all the way to the time of John, who wrote many, many years after Christ's coming. All of this had to have been done by the Holy Spirit. Because as I said earlier, scholars have been looking at this information now for 2,000 years since the Bible was completed. And just on that day, whatever I think I said, 31 October or whatever, it came to mind. And I'm sitting there thinking, now how can that be? It's because the word of God is so wonderfully immense that there are secrets that we'll be looking at for eons to come. So here they are in order so you can understand and remember them. The Ark of the Testimony containing the word of God. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word. Then next was described the veil which is the body of Christ, it explicitly said in the book of Hebrews, that's John 1, 14, next in order, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, okay? And then come the seven I am statements. First is the table of showbread. I am the bread of life, John 6, 35. It's next in order. After that, the menorah. I am the light of the world, John 8, 12. After that, the screen to the tent. I am the door, John 10, 7. After that came the altar. I am the good shepherd, John 10, verse 11. After that came the labor, I am the resurrection and the life, John eleven twenty five, 25. And then came the screen to the courtyard, I am the way, the truth, and the life, John 14, 6. And finally, the anointing of the priests, I am the true vine, John 15, verses 5 through 8. And after the seven I am's comes the final piece of furniture, which was described earlier and yet actually only bears later the altar of incense, which is Jesus' high priestly prayer of John 17, all in perfect order, Tell me that's not amazing. Tell me that, they, and every time you read this passage from now on out, I hope that you'll think of this. Go ahead. Selah. Unbelievable. How amazing is the word of God and how he ties our lives together with things like Selah this morning, the first of the year in the sermon, and all of the other things that he's put into his word, which are such a treasure. And we sit and we watch sports and we go to the movies and we do all these things which are fine to do, but we don't take an hour a day to read the Bible and to know God's heart and what he has intended for us. Verse 16, then Moses did according to all that the Lord had commanded him, so he did. This verse is rather similar to the final words of the previous chapter. There it said, according to all the work that the Lord had commanded Moses, so the children of Israel did all the work. Then Moses looked over all the work, and indeed they had done it as the Lord had commanded, just so they had done it, and Moses blessed them. The difference is that Moses was the one to approve the work of the people, and so he looked it over and approved it and blessed the people. In this verse, Moses is himself being obedient to the word, and the word itself is commending him for his actions. And so from construction to completion, the work is noted as having been accomplished according to all that the Lord had commanded. As I said at the beginning of the sermon, and during it as well, the way in which these several points have followed, the seven I am's of Jesus, is more than remarkable. 
The divine fingerprint is to be found all the way throughout scripture, each page validating that more than just human wisdom was involved in the process. I absolutely guarantee you that John did not sit down and say, well, what the one is next and how can I fit this into there? That was the last thing on that guy's mind at the time. The many places it was compiled, the many personalities involved in it, and the length of time in which these things took to be recorded is its own validation that we are handling in our own hands the very word of God. But adding on to that is the fact that these many patterns, such as the one today, have been left unseen for 2,000 years that this book has been studied by faithful scholars. How is it that such patterns can suddenly come forth and yet people deny that there is a deep <coughs> wisdom to be found in the word? Let us not fall into such skepticism, but rather let us behold the beauty of this word, treasure its secrets in our hearts, and continue to look for more remarkable patterns which are waiting still for curious eyes to gaze upon and to light upon to the glory of God who has placed them there. And as we have seen numerous times today, these patterns reveal Christ. God is trying to wake us up to our need for Christ. And so once again today, I would like to explain very quickly and with care how you too can share in God's marvelous offer of peace, which is granted through him. The Bible speaks all the way from the beginning to the end of one who is to come who will restore to us that which was lost at the very beginning, access to the Garden of Eden, the place where God resides with man. And that person was promised and his name is Jesus. He came and he fulfilled all of these types and shadows. He lived the perfect life that we can't live. He lived under the law that we're looking at and all of the types and symbols and pictures, all of it points to him. He fulfilled that law and he gave his life up as our sacrifice. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays his life down for the sheep. And he says, if you will simply believe that act, if you will believe in me that I am who is prophesied and I am who is spoken of since then, you'll have everlasting life. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It is a gift. You can't earn it. You can't work for it. You can't disgrace God in that way. You just simply reach out your hand and take it. And I would ask that if you have never done that, of all days today when you've seen something that has never been seen before, as far as I know in all of human history, this has never been seen before, and yet it is as precise as it can be. It follows beautifully what God is trying to show us in the person of Jesus. I am, I am, I am, I am, I am, I am. Our closing verse comes from John 8. It's verse 58. Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Next week is Exodus 40. It's verses 17 through 38. I tried to find a word to rhyme, so I didst. It's entitled, The Lord in Their Midst. That'll be our 105th, and guess what? Our final Exodus sermon. Absolutely. Finish up another book of the Bible, finally. It's been, I think, uh, I don't remember when we started, but it's been a while. We've been in it for at least three or four weeks. I'll tell you this before we close today. The Lord has you exactly where he wants you. He has a good plan and a purpose for you. And even if a deep ocean lies ahead of you, he can part the waters and he can lead you through it on dry ground. And so follow him and trust him and he'll do marvelous things for you and through you, okay? Our poem today, anybody want to guess what the title of the poem is today? I am, I am. thank you. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, these are the words he was then relaying. On the first day of the first month, do not forget the tabernacle of the tent of meeting up you shall set. You shall put in it the ark of the testimony, please understand, and partition off the ark with the veil per my command. You shall bring in the table and arrange the things that are to be set in order on it, and you shall bring in the lampstand and light its lamps. To this you shall commit. You shall also set the altar of gold for the incense before the ark of the testimony and put up the screen for the door of the tabernacle Follow this order as given by me. Then you shall set the altar of the burnt offering before the door of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. And you shall set the laver between the tabernacle of meeting and the altar and put water in it. No portion of this detail shall be allowed to falter. You shall set up the court all around as I now state and hang up the screen at the court gate. And you shall take the anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle and all that is in it. And you shall hallow it and all its utensils, and it shall be holy as to you I submit. You shall anoint the altar of the burnt offering and all its utensils and the altar consecrate. The altar shall be most holy. 
This condition of it I now to you relate. And you shall anoint the laver and its base, and consecrate it there in its place. Then you shall bring Aaron and his sons to the door of the tabernacle of meeting, and wash them with water on them, water you shall pour. Then you shall put the holy garments on Aaron, and anoint him, and consecrate him too, that he may minister to me as priest. These things to him you are to do. And you shall bring his sons, and clothe them with tunics, so shall it be. You shall anoint them as you anointed their father, that they may as priests minister to me. For their anointing shall surely be an everlasting priesthood throughout their generations as is to be understood. Thus Moses did each and everything as he was bid, according to all that the Lord had commanded him, so he did. Heavenly Father, how precious is your word, and how marvelous it is to read and find Jesus. Each page that we turn, it reveals our great Lord, who has done such wonderful things for us. O oh God, our hearts are directed to you, and so be with us in all that we do. Let us never stray from the path which is true, and each day through your word, please our souls renew. And in this we will give you our highest praise as we wait on our Lord's return, that most marvelous of days. Hallelujah and amen. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this precious word. It's big, it's complicated, it's something that people have been reading for eons and eons, and yet you are still <laughs> shining forth wonderful mysteries out of it, which are then revealed to us and belong to us and our generations afterward. What a gift and what a, what a treasure it is. Thank you for all the things that you have done for us in the year behind us. We look forward in eager anticipation of what lies ahead of us. We thank you for the delivery that we got in this nation a couple months ago, or maybe a little less than that, and which is hopefully going to be uh, realized in the next 18 days. And we also thank you for the great hope that we have that maybe this year will be the year that you come to take us home. And be that through death or be that through rapture, we're waiting for it. And what a great day that'll be. We thank you for that sure hope that we have, and we thank you because it is we thank you that it is sure because of the work of Jesus, our Lord. And so in his name, we pray. Amen. Amen. You know, I got up to, I, I could probably tell you, seeing as how you asked, I got up to, I think, um, I, it, it seems to strike me that I was at about, um, yeah, here it is. Uh, verse 5, it says the screen or Masaka, and it goes to, the, he is the door, John 10, 7. And I wrote these words. I said, the order of his proclamations follows in a remarkable way with the orders of the things now being set up. And I thought, huh. And I got to the next one, and I went, oh. And I realized, sure enough, this is following a pattern which John has in the book of, of uh, you know, in his book, his gospel. And it just, it was amazing. And then I got to the very end, and I thought, I didn't realize the I had skipped the altar until this week as I was I'd already printed off the sermon and everything and I realized wait a minute the altar doesn't have an I am but yet it's a piece of furniture and then I realized that it and I said this in a previous sermon not this sermon I'd already said it so the precedent had been set that the altar answers to the ark of the testimony just as the altar here answers to the door and that's when I realized so the the last parts the part going around the outside I figured out later, I mean, within the past week. So, what am I, and if that's true, how much have I missed that is still out there, right? I mean, it's just the most amazing thing. This word is, is way too precious for us to neglect and to say, oh, that, that's, you know, that's chance and that's random. There's no way. You could have a million monkeys typing on a million typewriters for all of eternity, and they couldn't come up with Shakespeare's, you know, et tu brute, much less what we have here. And we've got 40 authors over you know, 1,300 years or so, let me see, Moses, uh, 1,600 years, and that we've got the patterns which are revealed in the, the uh, verse numbers and the chapter divisions, which didn't come for another 1,500 years after that. Right. No way. God's hand is all over this precious word, all over it. Talking about this word, Lord's table, we get right from the word, the words that Paul wrote for us to observe this, this memorial. Excuse me. He wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, For I received from the Lord that which I also de delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And he would have given thanks over it. He would have said these words, Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu, Melecha olam hamotzi lechem min haaretz. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. I am the bread of life, right? And he broke it. And he said, take and eat. 
This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, and he would have blessed us as well. He would have said, Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu, Melech HaOlam, Borei Peri HaGafen. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. This, is, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You okay? Do you want to got one? Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Happy New Year. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for the sound of firecrackers last night ushering in the new year and the prospect that it holds, and thank you that uh, we have a chance to, no matter what happens, good or bad in the year ahead, that we have the chance to have called on Jesus and to be a part of what is happening in your redemptive workings and help us to have a heart for those that have not called on Jesus and to be bold to even times of trial or trouble or, you know, not wanting to do what we should be doing to get out and do it, to hand out the track at the restaurant, to speak at the people in the projects, to bring Jesus into people's lives in ways that, uh, that will bring them to understand who he is because every one of us has been given that opportunity. Until you come for us, help us to be responsible to do the same as well. We love you and we praise you, Lord God. We thank you for every person that's here today, every person that's attending online, and those that may watch the sermon later, that they would be blessed and have a great new year in your presence. And as I said, regardless of what happens, whether it's for uh, ill or for uh, health, it doesn't really matter because we have the surety of Jesus Christ. Thank you for that. We love you and we praise you in his name. Amen. Amen.